Good evening. Hi. Welcome to Northrop. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to tonight's event, uh, Will Steger's Eyewitness to Climate Change. And I'd like to introduce uh, the organizer and, uh, and among the friends of the libraries, the university librarian, Wendy Pratt-Luger, who is also a McKnight pr presidential professor. And tonight's event, as she will also say, is co-sponsored by the Friends of the Libraries, by the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, the Institute on the Environment, and Northrop. And uh, without further ado, because I know you really want to get to the good stuff, Wendy Pratt-Luger. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, tonight is, is the second uh, in what we hope will be an exciting season of events for the Friends of the University Libraries. And I want to thank the Friends for all that they do to uh, help share the libraries uh, with uh, both the campus and the community. And they do that by hosting wonderful events, uh, including tonight's uh, with internationally renowned explorer Will Steger. Steger. And we're challenged, I think, through all of these events to gain a new perspective, uh, to explore new worlds. Um, we always come away inspired, I think. I want to especially thank the co-sponsors, as Jennifer mentioned, not only the Institute for Advanced Study, the Institute on Environment, and Northrop, as well as the nonprofit Will Steger has established, Climate Generation. And last but not least, I want to have a special call out to Jim Lenfesty here. Uh, who is not only a Friends Board member, but also uh, um, serves on the advisory board for Climate Generation and was instrumental in making this event tonight happen, so we're very grateful for that. So I must admit, we didn't plan it this way, uh, but the timing of tonight's event couldn't have been better in terms of climate change being very much in the news this week. On Monday, Pope Francis made headlines with his statement, Quote, we are at the limit. If I may use a strong word, I would say that we are at the limits of suicide, end quote. And the same day, 28 of the world's wealthiest and most powerful individuals, including Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, announced the formation of a new alternative energy nonprofit, the Breakthrough, Breakthrough Energy Corporation, to invest in clean technology initiatives. And then, of course, on Monday, the United Nations Climate Change Summit began bringing representatives from 195 nations to Paris to create an international agreement that addresses climate change. In short, the whole world is watching and awakening. So we are indeed fortunate uh, that Will Steger is with us during this very auspicious week to share his extraordinary insights and observations as an eyewitness to climate change. Now perhaps you already know a good deal about Will Steger, but here's a story that perhaps tells you how it all began. When Will was only 15 years old, he and his brother piloted an old motorboat down the Mississippi from Minnesota to New Orleans. At 17, he journeyed to the Arctic, and the rest, as we say, is history. At 41, he made the first confirmed journey to the North Pole, without resupply, leading a team of eight people and 50 sled dogs. And two years later, he guided the longest unsupported dog sled expedition in history, a 1,600-mile north-to-south trek across Greenland. He's the fourth person ever to reach both the North and the South Poles. He joins Roald Amundsen, Amelia Earhart, Admiral Robert Perry, and Jacques Cousteau, in winning the National Geographic's John Oliver Lagorce Medal for uh, accomplishments in geographic exploration in the sciences and public service to advanced international understanding. That award, by the way, has only been awarded 19 times in the society's 127-year history. He's an educator, he's an activist, an author, a photographer, and of course, an explorer. He's stories to tell and an important message for us to hear during a time of heightened interest on this important issue. And following Will's presentation, he'll be joined on stage for an interview with Todd Robald. Todd is the Director of Communications for the Institute on the Environment, one of tonight's co-sponsors. 
and he's also the founding editor and publisher of the Institute's award-winning magazine, Encia, and there's some copies out there on the table for you. He's interviewed luminaries such as ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, the Nature Conservancy president Mark Tersek, and tonight, of course, Will Steger. Please join me in welcoming Minnesota's own Will Steger. Thank you for the introduction. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, special thanks to Jim Lemfesty who organized this and invited me here and friends of the libraries. And um, I represent uh, Climate Generation, formerly the Will Steger Foundation. And uh, we work in three areas. We work in K-12 uh, curriculum and teacher enhancement. For We work in uh, climate and energy in those areas. We also, the second area, youth activism, both high school, college, and after college. And then we work a lot behind the scenes on policy. Uh, three years ago, uh, with Nicole Rahm, my director, and Michael Noble, myself, uh, the governor gave us the assignment of writing the climate and energy policy for the state. And uh, we were able then that, this is a year, uh, three years ago in December, and then that next uh, session, we were able to get about 80% of that passed. And um, I've taken uh, my eyewitness to climate change. I've traveled in the Arctic for about 50 years now. And the scientists in the, in the 80s said the first changes would be uh, occurred in the, in the Arctic. And uh, I've been on the ice on these changes. And I wanted to show you my uh, observations. Um, I used this uh, same uh, similar presentation 10 years ago back when we had a uh, majority of deniers and uh, it was really hard to get public venue around this, but I took, I took my, my story and uh, the eyewitness account to churches, congregations, actually all the conservative areas I could get into. I presented about 200 of these venues. And, uh, but this will show you uh, from the Arctic perspective, and then we'll bring that down closer to home. I'm only going to bore you with two, two uh, graphs here. This shows the fluctuation of carbon dioxide over, taken from an ice core in um, uh, Antarctica of over four, 400,000 years. And what this shows is a normal fluctuation of carbon dioxide. Uh, the temperature follows that. And this fluctuation is caused, major, majority of it's caused by um, variation in the Earth's orbit. The Earth is closer to the sun about every 110,000 years, which account for some of the major peaks there. And you have a, a wobble of the, of the Earth where the Earth leans into the sun, leans away every 42,000. And there's a couple other variations that gives this natural up and down. But then what you see here is this line suddenly going straight up. This is the beginning of the industrial age, and especially the last uh, 100 years, the last 50 years. This is an outdated slide. You have to update this every, almost every year. We're above the 400 mark right now. And the cause of that is the is majority of its car carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. And fossil fuels uh, uh, has a particular uh, fingerprint to it in the chemistry, and we know that's from the, from the carbon. And this is uh, taking a look at that cycle on a, on a up close and personal here. From 1960 up to 2015, we'd be right here. But you can see the steady rise. But um, this is the critical time here. Notice 350 parts per million. We reached that uh, in 19, right around 1990. And uh, the scientists predicted that this was the critical uh, point, because at 350 and above, ice starts melting. And when ice starts melting, this whole, whole thing, this, this was literally the, ter the tipping point was in 1990. That's when we got above 350.org, uh, 350. And what happened there is, of course, the ice, the polar sea, everything started changing. And this is what I want to show you here tonight. Uh, I want to take you on a trip across Antarctica to give you an idea of the, the environment, the expedition. This was 25 years ago. I led uh, an international team of six people from six countries. Uh, we crossed Antarctica, 3,700 miles, the longest possible route. Uh, as always, we traveled by dog team and uh, great adventure. And uh, I want to show you our route here. This is, we started in, the, in July of 18, uh, 1989. Uh, July is like our January. It's uh, middle middle winter time. We crossed the Larsen uh, the um, Larsen Ice Shelf. 
Uh, we had 60 days of storms here, and then we continued into the interior here. And we crossed this area was the area of inaccessibility. This, no one had ever crossed this region before. It's the coldest place on the Earth. And we made it out 222 days later. Uh, Antarctica is uh, divided into geographically two areas, the large eastern ice shelf, 3,000 miles across. Uh, this area, the, the top of it averages around 11,000 feet, has not changed much. The, uh, around the sides here, the perimeter has changed. The western ice shelf here, 1,000 miles across in either way, is the one that's really changing right now. If we look at this graph here, uh, the western ice shelf is right here. These are what's called um, the ice cap here. These are ice, ice shelves. This is where the ice flows out over the ocean. This is at sea level here. And uh, this is the Ross Ice Shelf. It's about 1,000 feet thick. Uh, the Ronnie is a similar situation. What this does is it flows over the ocean, and, it, and uh, it's almost like a, uh, it buttresses against the continent, and it keeps all these, all these glaciers and ice streams, this whole 500 miles of ice that's flowing down. It's almost like a cork in a wine bottle. If you turn the cork wine bottle upside down, the cork, as long as the cork's in place, that wine's okay. But if you pull the cork out, the wine, of course, will go on the floor. Now what's happening, since the ice shelves are right at sea level, they're subject to changes of sea level temperature, currents, uh, ocean uh, regular uh, air temperatures. And in the, on these ice shelves here, the Larsen ice shelf, um, most of these ice shelves are actually gone now. So these are starting to break up. Um, I want, and this is a kind of a close up here. It shows you how an ice shelf forms with uh, snow from open water. Uh, forming uh, glaciers and um, ice streams that flow out flow over the ocean. They, they naturally will break up you know, some distance away. But now with the advent of the changing climate, these ice shelves are breaking right here. And then along with that, you're getting a tremendous amount of ice that's starting to flow in. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a detailed picture here of the Antarctic Peninsula right in this area. And uh, you could actually put the state of Minnesota in, in this slide here. This is our route. This is the Larsen B A ice shelf. There's a mountain range, uh, Larsen B. Uh, it took us 30 days to cross this area. And when I, we first saw it from the plane, it was the biggest ice land feature I'd ever seen. This all disintegrated uh, 13 years ago. This all went. But I have some picture, uh, videos here showing the Larsen. Show, it'll show you what, what the uh, Larsen looks like, what it looked like. Also some idea of what, how this expedition plays out. Uh, this is flying in on, uh, to start the expedition. We're on a uh, twin otter. It's a, it's a double turboplane, uh, double engine on skis. We're flying along. I think this is the only video that I'm aware of of the Larson. Uh, these walls here are about, about 150 uh, to 175 feet high. And it extends down to the ocean about another 800 feet. Uh, the scientists believe that this ice shelf was laid down about 12,000 years ago in the last ice shelf, I, uh, last ice uh, period, last glacial age. And uh, this is on the beginning, we're right on the edge of this actually. Uh, we had 30 dogs here, three dog teams. You can see how well behaved the dogs are. And uh, It's a sign of really good teams, so though. They're really, really excited. Um, I've traveled over 30,000 miles by dogs in the polar regions in my career, and um, I normally travel an international team of six people, three dog teams. Uh, each sled weighs about 1,000 pounds. We bred our own, our own dogs. We call the polar husky. They're kind of a cross between Eskimo breed and a little bit of wolf and Alaskan dogs. You can see the thick fur. These dogs are right at home at 40 below. Uh, if it gets above uh, freezing up above, above zero Fahrenheit, they overheat. You also see they're they're real uh, they're pretty wild little animals, but when they're young. But uh, we socialize them; they love this human contact. Uh, but any, more than anything, they just love the pull. They love the snow. This is the beginning of the trip. You can see the enthusiasm here. We bred this kind of a racing spirit attitude into the dogs. This is the Larsen A ice shelf. Uh, again, this is the, the edge of the polar night. We have 18 hours of darkness and six, six hours of perpetual twilight. Uh, we're right on, the, you know, right on the ice shelf. We're basically almost at sea level. Uh, we didn't have, the weather was not too bad. We had a couple of storms, but for the most part, it was pretty calm. Uh, that area now is, is gone. Uh, 
There was a mountain range that separated the uh, Larsen A and the B, and which were going up right here. You notice we're always on skis. There isn't, in fact, on the sled itself, there isn't a place to ride. So you're constantly riding, riding or skiing alongside of it here. And uh, you're always commanding the dogs. You're always back and forth okay, with them, up. as you can see here. These crevasses were quite dangerous. Uh, fortunately, we only had them when we went up and down mountain ranges. Most of the time we were on the plateau, we didn't have to bother with them. Uh, but it was a severe cold. We had average winds uh, 30, 40 miles an hour, average temperature minus 30. Wind chills 80 to 100 below were common. And uh, I had a partner, John Louis Atien, that I met on the way to the North Pole three years ago, two years before this. Uh, he, he, he was a diplomat. He brought the Soviet Union on board in China. Um, I was in charge of organizing the team with the dogs and the people and, and the training or, and also raising the money for the expedition itself. So we were kind of a partnership between the two of us. And um, this is in a very, very dangerous uh, crevasse field. We use these dog blankets. We put those underneath uh, the harness. So the danger here is if a dog falls through a cr crevasse, they're, there's, they're tied in, but the problem is that they can slip out of their harness. And that's what we're doing here. We're putting on these blankets here. And this is an extremely dangerous situation. A dog fell in. Uh, Victor and I are not roped up here. And this dog is penduling back and forth. We're trying to calm the dog down, but at the same time trying to get it, get it up. And I have a constant rapport with him to try to get the dog kind of calm so he doesn't panic. And then we very delicately here start pulling them up. Those are the Soviet Union, United States flag, some of you remember the days. Get us harder, get us harder. Come on, Bobby. Get up here. Okay. There we go. Yeah, we, ne we didn't lose any dogs in crevasses, but all of us had plenty of climbing experience, but it was terrifying in these crevasse fields. But for the most part, this was actually an uh, unusual day. It was not really blowing. It was about 50 below. And uh, if it's not blowing, 50 is pretty, pretty mild temperature. And uh, you're moving all the time, so you stay warm. But this was a this would be actually a good day because we could actually see all three sleds. We had six, uh, 60 days of storms, uh, and um, uh, Victor, the Soviet the guy from the Soviet Union, one of my best friends here, was he led all the way on skis. Uh, it's best to have a person in front of the dogs that keeps them occupied, and uh, then you see we're always two people on a sled. And this is on the uh, 11,000 feet, the area of inaccessibility. This is the, the area where no one had ever traveled across. It was just a uh, really cold place. It was summertime, so it was like 25 below. It was actually quite pleasant. Um, you can see our pace here. We, we would travel 10-hour uh, 10, 10 days in these situations and then 10 straight days and a day off. So uh, we went that way for four months. We went 10 on, one off, so that basically three, three days off. And this was our pace. Um, Actually, it was quite a beautiful situation here until we entered the uh, storm zone again. Then I want to take us back here to the uh, Lar Larson Ice Shelf. Um, uh, this is where we, uh, the dog ran away here. The plane came in. The dog in the crevasse was here. Where you saw the wind in that was this area here. So we're going to look at this here with a satellite view. And uh, the date here, as you see, January 31st, 02. Uh, 
This Larsen A right here had broke up uh, several years before, but we're going to look at this section. It's about 150 miles across. A little detail here. This is before the Larsen uh, broke up. So what you're looking at, open ocean. It's about 100 miles here from the ocean. These are some of the longest glaciers in the world. What's unusual here was that was an uh, all-time record warm day, a year, and for the first time ever, there was uh, water on the ice. And when you would get water lakes on an ice, that changes the uh, structure of the ice. The ice water goes through, the uh, ice gets weak. That's how lakes here break up. But uh, it changed the structure on that. And then right, right around the uh, 31st or so, the 31st of, of uh, January, you start break, it started breaking up. Some of these chunks of ice are the size of small New England states. And within 32 days, this entire ice shelf uh, disintegrated into the ocean. And um, I remember about a week later reading the Minneapolis Tribune. I was just paging through it, uh, about page nine, way in the back. There was a photo of the Larson, and it said, Larson ice shelf disintegrates. And this was literally my call to action. I, I uh, was building my center up in Ely, and I basically you know, moved down here, set up shop. I started the Will Steger Foundation around that. But what happened here was um, the, the alarming thing was that the scientists had no idea that this ever could happen. And um, so this disintegrated. You didn't have the ocean rising because the ice was floating in it. But now the ice is gone. The cork is out of the bottle. And you have a tremendous amount of movement of this ice, a lot of ice going into the ocean right now. And then these ice shelves also shelter the continent from the warmer ocean water. So once they disintegrate, you get the ocean, the warmer water right coast to coast, and now they're getting heavy, heavy rains there, which, which again causes that more. Um, I want to show you the Greenland ice cap, talk a little bit about ice cap disintegration. Greenland's a, a very fine example. Uh, as mentioned, I, I traverse that north-south. I've crossed it uh, east-west by kite ski. And uh, 92 was an uh, average year of, of the, what used to be average. And the red here shows... Uh, the, the thawing zones. In other words, July and August, the thaws went up to about 1,000 feet, maybe a little bit under in the red zone. And then we look at here 10 years ahead. Uh, you can see that the thawing level during the summer is starting to creep up to 3,000. And then, then it's, uh, it gets really progressive. 05 here, it's up to about 5,000 feet. And then uh, 2012, for the first time, it thawed all the way to the top of 10,300 feet. Now, in a short summer, you're not going to have a whole uh, ice cap of two miles of ice melting off. But the problem here, again, is the water. Uh, the water does not flow right across the ice and down, down into the ocean. It collects. It collects in uh, lakes, and these lakes fill. They drain off, and either once the rivers form, the rivers find their own holes like this or the drain itself. Gravity pulls this water down. And when it's pulled down, uh, it, gets, it flows out at the bottom of the glaciers, which lubricates the ice, and then these glaciers start surging. Uh, we're seeing commonly now uh, many glaciers in Greenland are surging at uh, 15 miles a year. Remember maybe when you were young studying glaciology or classes, um, glacial pace used to be meters. That was uh, meters a year. And um, this, is, this is a little video here that shows that. I pulled this one off the web. And you can see the, um, the little lake here. I can't get my pointer there. The lake will drain, you know, so then it lubricates it. That slides. And then the, what the problem is, is everything, it's like a dam. Everything in back of that starts going. Now, um, I wanted to, uh, let's see, let me get this. I wanted to see this firsthand. So in 2008, I organized a kite skiing expedition in the summertime to cross Greenland east to west by using kites and skis. Um, I had three of the top polar kiters that were 21 and 22 from uh, Norway and uh, Canada. I, I was neophyte here. I was the, the student. And um, we were training here. We were about 5,000 feet. You're looking actually down at the ocean here that's fogged in. But you, you travel by uh, skis, uh, regular downhill skis, and then you control, it, control the kite with your uh, things there. And, and you travel... Uh, when the wind's blowing, we would travel straight, sometimes, um, you know, 36 hours uh, straight because the winds would blow and then they would stop. And on a, on a windy day, we would sometimes travel over 100 miles. But you're pulling your sleds with you. The sleds weigh about 250 pounds. Uh, and it's much more difficult than a, on a dog sled. You've got the backup of dogs. 
but here you're, you're doing all the hard work yourself. And uh, this is right at the top of the ice cap at, at 9,000 feet, and we're traveling along here with a good wind at our back with a big load of uh, gear in, in the back. You could travel 2,000 miles, two months unsupported this way. It's really a great way of traveling in the summer on the, on the ice cap. But what we found here at, uh, this is the late July, the thaw season is just underway. Uh, we hit our fir first water at 6,700 feet, which was a, a record that had never been seen before. And we could cross this at first, but then gradually as this water started flowing more, we had larger and larger rivers of water. And, um, and then we couldn't get across these. And we spent a long time trying to find until these things would end. And uh, what was really strange here, traveling on an ice cap, there's no sound. There's a sound of the wind by a, uh, your guy lines in the tent, but the sound of running water is just really strange. And that's a sign of an ice cap disintegrating, because that does not happen. Uh, we flew out. Uh, this is a, a river here that's about uh, three quarters of a mile wide. You notice all of a sudden it just disappears. This is another river that's very deep. This one flowed for about a little less than 10 miles, and then, then just almost like a Grand Canyon, it cascaded, and that dropped straight down uh, about a mile through the, through the ice. But it wasn't until we found, um, got to the, uh, the shoreline is that we started seeing. We were, on a, we were in land here on an island, so we were safe. Uh, this is called calving, ice breaking off at the foot of the glacier. It's a normal occurrence, but what is abnormal is the amount of ice. Uh, this would occur over and over. This was about the size of the IDS tower, uh, about a mile wide, uh, turning totally under like this. This afternoon that we were there, this went on and on and on. These big chunks would fall out. Uh, I, I can't tell you what, what it's like seeing this firsthand. Um, and this is, a, uh, this is the beginning of the great sea level rise. This, this would have been in 08. Uh, the sea level started rising right around that time from the melting of ice, and now the ice is going up higher and higher. And by the way, all, all the models have been so conservative on the predictions. Uh, the prediction on the sea level model up two meters by the turn of the century is very conservative. We're going to see a lot more than that happening. Um, I want to show you another, uh, one more uh, video here. Um, Jim Baylog, a good friend of mine, did, uh, he would fly into these remote areas and he would leave time-lapse cameras that were solar powered and you'd come back the next year and pick up the film. He did a movie called Chasing Ice. Uh, it was here um, at the Lagoon Theater here about three or four years ago. Some of you probably saw it, but I got this picture from Jim. It's a it's uh, the largest glacier in the northern hemisphere, three miles wide here. And what you're seeing over a 75 minute period, you're seeing a section three miles wide, one, one mile th uh, uh, the other width, and actually 3,000 uh, 3, feet thick breaking up. And just a matter of uh, the time that we spent together here this evening. And uh, a lot of his footage is really dynamic like this. And uh, it's hard to get a size comparison, but he zooms back here, and you'll see it here in a little bit. I remember when I first saw this, it was just uh, quite remarkable. A dome full of deniers. <coughs> there. And I, this, this is actually a good point, because the, the problem we have is political. Uh, we're we're ten, 10 years behind now, but we still, we still can avoid the worst of the catastrophe. And, and uh, we'll talk about Paris maybe on our questions and answers. We, uh, the climate generation, we have a delegation of 10 teachers and three staff over there right now. But it's really, I and mean, politically we're moving, but uh, we still have... Uh, half our government, as you know, uh, still denying this. I'm not sure how long that this can go, but go on. Uh, but the political, the, the political problem is why we haven't really moved on this because we have the technology. I want to close off here talking about the Arctic Ocean. Um, uh, right here is the North Pole. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is a deep ocean basin the size of the United States and Mexico combined. 
Uh, it used to be covered by a layer of, at an average of around 12 feet of ice now that's about four feet. Um, I spent over a thousand days of my life, uh, evenings, usually 24 hour light, camping on this ice in the land of the polar bear. And um, uh, I've been to the pole four times and in 95 we crossed the Arctic Ocean from Russia to, to here to the pole. I have just a few pictures from that expedition to show you the dynamics of the ice. Um, <clears throat> It's a very, very challenging place to travel on. The ice is constantly moving for three to eight miles a day. In storms, it can go 12, you know, 20 miles a day. <clears throat> the ice is moving, breaking up. In the areas you have, it comes together in these huge uh, shear zones that are very difficult to find your way through. And then pressure ridges that build up. You have you know, literally a, th a thousand of these on a crossing. Heavy sleds, a thousand pounds. Uh, one of the challenges. And then the other th challenge is this ice then, the wind will, wind will change. Mostly the movement is by wind. And then this ice will start opening up. Even, even in the cold winters when it's 50 below, uh, you can have ice that just suddenly breaks up. Um, we, we always camp in certain areas of multi-year ice, year that ice has been around for many years. And most of the multi-year ice is now gone. Uh, it's broke up in uh, 07, 08. Um, in, 90, in the 90s, we start seeing uh, the huge changes occur. Uh, tremendous amount of open water. Uh, it was quite startling, actually. And became, the surface became very dangerous uh, crossing. Uh, uh, we put sleds in the water, people in the water, dogs, this whole thing. Um, and then in 95, we ended up, when we were close to the North American continent, 100 miles out, we flew the dogs out because we knew that it would be too dangerous for them. And we were in a shear zone here where the ice was really moving. And we transferred over to canoes, uh, we call it canoe sled, canoe with runners. And we were able there with that, it was uh, safer. We could paddle the water, then haul, haul on the ice here with skis or just hauling like this. But uh, this is a picture, this is uh, for myself. I never ever thought I would see my, uh, a picture, let alone myself, canoeing on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, right now, it's, uh, it's impossible to reach the pole by dogs. From, I think that's the last of the dog sled expeditions. Probably within a couple years, it's going to be impossible to reach it, uh, even by hauling your sled. You need some form of flotation right now, either a sled that floats or a way of getting across this water. So I mean, that, that just happened in the last 10 years. Is, uh, this, is how, this is how rapid the changes are occurring. Uh, this is what's happening in the Arctic. Uh, this would have been uh, 30 years ago, normal, normal situation. Um, in the Arctic, you get uh, polar regions at 24-hour uh, light for five months. So you have you know, the perfect uh, solar panel weather. So you've got the solar energy for five months hitting, hitting the top of the globe. But it used to strike uh, just snow or ice. 95% of that was, was covered. And that would reflect that energy back in. But then in the 90s, so this, this uh, second to the top one, is with the warming ocean, warming atmosphere, you start getting thawing. And once you got thawing, you got now a little bit of exposed water, which is dark, a lot of exposed land. Uh, so you're starting to get absorption. And then in 07, we had the 50% uh, of the Arctic Ocean disintegrated, which again caught the scientists totally off guard and the 50% that broke up was mostly this multi-year ice, which is the breeding ice. And then this ice would again freeze up the next winter because you have five months of darkness. We're always going to have cold coming into the polar areas because you get, you get this five months of darkness, the cold comes from outer space. The di distribution of that cold is what's going to vary because you remember two years ago the polar vortex. Right now we were 20 below. And now this area, this, win this winter, we're getting the, the, uh, the warm weather from the Pacific, which is record high. Uh, so this is changing. And then we're, we are rapidly heading into a situation where we're going to have an open Arctic Ocean during, during, during the summertime, and which will, again, open up a shipping lane, which is going to be very unusual. Uh, the idea of having the Northwest Passage as the shipping lane, that, that just won't happen. Uh, the shipping lane is just going to be over, over the top. And then that exposes exposes more vast Saudi Arabia, uh, more, more, uh, more oil, more methane. You know, this insanity has to slow down. And I'm really happy to hear the president uh, say uh, last month when, we, when, when the big pipeline was X'd that we need to put, keep some of this uh, 
petroleum and coal in the ground. And, and I think we have to, this is what we, we have to move towards because it's just going too fast, too much. So what, we're, what we had, had here is a, it's, it's a, um, called an albedo flip when you have a, a reflective area refl and then flipping over to a dark area. And uh, this is, and then that warms more and more. And then what we're seeing now, what's changed in the last three years here is that we're all seeing uh, climate change. It's all over. We're talking about it. But with, what we have firsthand, we all have stories about it. We hear it all the time in the news, but we see it here right in Minnesota. Three years ago, uh, um, up in my country in Ely, Minnesota, we had the huge forest fires, uh, the Bogami fire here uh, that ran uh, 18 miles in one day. And, um, and then we had big fires that next May. And then three weeks after the big fires, we had the uh, torrential biblical flood in Duluth, 17 inches of rain that caused a quarter billion dollars worth of uh, infrastructure dam damage. Uh, we have this drought that is pronounced uh, in the California and Southwest. Occasionally that drought will come here. Fortunately, the last two years we've been very, very, very fortunate uh, in Minnesota. Our, our agriculture this year was really good. Last year we got on just on the edge. Uh, but the changing climate, you get the drought, you get the, these heavy wet weather events, uh, something that we're all becoming familiar with. And um, solutions, which uh, we'll probably talk to here with when um, Todd and I have the discussion, we're going to do some questions and answers. So I'm not going to go too much in, in, in solutions, but the solutions lie in two, two areas. Of course, uh, m moving into renewable energy sources. Uh, uh, Minnesota, has, we, we uh, spend almost $18 billion a year in fossil fuels. In this, uh, and that most of that profit, of course, goes to foreign countries and fat cats and the coal, coal industry, and we don't really prosper from that at all. And it's, it, it's, a, it's been a fight the last two, uh, 10 years, tooth and nail, but we now have a huge industry of uh, 15 going on 20,000 jobs created in, this, in the clean energy jobs. Because just think, if we, we want to capture that 18 billion, we want that 18 billion to be our own jobs, our own ta tax base. Uh, for it go, goes for our schools, and this is this is the way we'll do it here in Minnesota. So the switching over to clean energy, and we're we're poised in a very good uh, situation here. We have good leadership here too in the state, and then the other part of it is is the big big part of the equation too is the conservation of energy, everywhere from lighting to insulation, and, and this is where the real job creation is. Um, <clears throat> I want to conclude uh, my talk here, and, and then we'll go into the discussion. Is that you know, all my life I sought out expeditions, and uh, I sought out expeditions because I really like to get on that very edge. Uh, I started climbing. In fact, I climbed the face of the Northrop Auditorium and uh, these little blocks here to the top when I was in high school. And I was glad when they preserved this building that they, they put the built blocks still there. But I used to climb and wall climb and, and kayak and then dog sledding, and um, I solo but I, I like to be on that edge where I have to, it forces me to be at my very best, not just physically, but spiritually, mentally. And especially when you bring a team of people there where you all of a sudden collectively in this wilderness surroundings, everyone's working together and, and it's amazing, especially if you get an international teams, that's where it's at, at its best. And it's, it's amazing what you can do beyond anything you could ever happen. And we're in this situation now, we're really on the edge. Uh, and we, we're in a place where we have to really be thoughtful. We have to be at our best. We can't get negative. Uh, negativity, bad attitudes, going to take us down. Uh, that's one of the things that we're going to be facing here, facing overwhelming thing. But uh, there's something about the human spirit, especially collectively. And I have to remind everybody that this is really an international problem. Uh, we're starting here in Minnesota, setting the example. For, and we're one of the num number two, I think, in the state. And we will be one, number one here with the Dayton administration, and that's what's going to happen. But it's an, it's an international, of course, what we're seeing in Paris. And I wouldn't get down too much on the, uh, the political scene here. We've got to continue to work that, on that, and not, not just get against Republicans, but we really have to work with the Republicans to get these jobs going and maybe see the light here. We can maybe agree to disagree on the climate, but uh, we all agree, I would think, on, on the economy part of it. Uh, but the rest of the world, uh, you know, you don't have this denial. 
<clears throat> in Europe, it's just incredible what's happening there. So there's a tremendous amount of hope, and we're all part of that, and that's what we have to see. So, so thank you, and uh, Todd and I will come up, up, up and do the second part. <clears throat> Wow. <laughs> I, think, I think that deserves another hand, everyone. Thank you. Well, I have a few serious questions for you I want to get into here, but I have to okay. ask you a not too serious question to start with about the dog that fell in the crevasse. Yeah. It looked really heavy. How much do those dogs usually weigh? Yeah, about 100 pounds. Wow. It's, it's amazing in an emergency. Um, See, and that, as I was the last sled, and it was the last dog that went over this, and this dog went in. So I had to hold on to this dog without being roped up into the sled, and he was dangling. And, but it's amazing. I had two dogs once that went in when I was alone. And uh, in an emergency like that, you hear about you know, 98 pounders lifting up a car, but it's amazing when your heart's in it that the weight, you don't even feel it. Yeah. I want to ask you about COP21, the climate conference that's happening in Paris right now, which you mentioned. There's a lot of talk about what might actually come out of the Paris negotiations. What are you hoping will be the result of the discussions that are happening right there? Yeah, I'm, we're, we're all hoping for a binding agreement, mm -hmm. something that we can take home. Uh, and uh, if, if the president in our end, if the president can't get through the, the Congress and that he has presidential powers and also the power of veto to veto the other nonsense that will try to counter that. But, but not so, and uh, ch the great news is China is really on board on this. India is starting, uh, there's challenges there, but it's really up to us to uh, start developing this technology that's gonna save the day, I mean. You mentioned the Congress, and I wanted to ask you about that too. Some of you may have heard just yesterday, members of Congress have already started saying they're going to veto or kill whatever comes out of the Paris negotiations. How do we move past this political grid gridlock in the country? I mean, what, what needs to change? short of voting people out of office, I suppose. Yeah, I think, I mean, I always go back to the youth. It's a cliche, but not so on this case. Um, uh, this younger generation that we're, I'm always immersed in is really remarkable. And, and it always seems in the evolution of the human race, uh, the right thing happens at the right time. And uh, uh, there, I've never had a climate argument there. Uh, and I think the the, uh, the Republican Party right now is really isolating themselves like this. I don't think that's going to fare well. I think you're, you're going to see a big difference on this election coming up in the federal. Uh, I don't think that's going to fly in the public. And I think it's, uh, it's very important that the youth vote. And hopefully, I think around the climate you might get. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a voting block, which is, has a huge potential. But we all have to do our part in that. So you mentioned youth, and uh, I wanted to ask you a question about Climate Generation, which is a great name, by the way, and a great organization. If you're not already a supporter, you should definitely join in and support their work. Um, why the focus on youth and educators? What, why, why did you feel that that was really critical to making a difference around this issue? Yeah, you know, all my, uh, the Climate Generation actually represents in my legacy my lifelong work in education and environment. And I, I was a school teacher in the late 60s. I taught global warming in my classes. Um, but uh, it's what I've, we've always done that was best. In 2002, when I came down here, I, I was upset about the political situation at that time and the environment, so I thought, well, what am I best at? But I think the youth and the environment has always been a solid and more, more so than now, and, uh, and so we, that's what we focused on. It can be a really uh, hopeless feeling when it comes to climate change, but I think the sense I got from your talk was that the kernel of hope that you find it seemed like was around the next generation really making a difference. You know, when I, uh, when I need some energy, I, I look at young kids playing and high school kids. And I don't have kids of my own, but, you know, I always felt that the kids of the world are my kids. I always felt that way. So I, I get a lot of energy from the younger generation because I, I see what's hap what we're up against. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're all starting to see that. So you mentioned this obviously being a global challenge that we're facing, but closer to home here in Minnesota, are there certain policies or, or legislation that you think needs to happen next? I mean, what are, the, what are the changes we need to be thinking about in Minnesota to make a contribution to this challenge? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really heading in a great direction. Um, and the next election is going to be a big one because if, 
we managed to get uh, the majority in the state. I know the governor's been working uh, in climate and energy and also behind many other things, but he's poised and everybody's poised to really make some hay in those two years, but we also could lose the majority. It's, it's really tricky because it's this is political thing, but, uh, but Minnesota's well away along on that. With uh, We have an industry going. Um, we have an economy that's starting, and, uh, and you know, the economy is a constituency that's very, very important. And as this grows and grows, it's pretty hard to disassemble people's jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th this is what I think we'll see here in Minnesota. There was an article that really struck me that was actually in The Economist just a couple days ago in the lead up to Paris. And this article was saying, we've known about climate change for decades. It's really been in the public consciousness for about 25 years or so now. We're seeing all this development around re renewable energy. But as you pointed out, that parts per million number keeps rising and rising and rising. So are we moving fast enough, do you think? Do we need to? Take yeah, we're, yeah. We, we have to move uh, a lot more, in, you know, in, intellectually. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to, uh, I mean, we have to look at our own lives and uh, our consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just us individually not consuming and watching trans where we do, we do, and I don't have to give you 10 ways of what we do, but uh, we have to, within our own life, but you look at our sphere of influence, and then also, again, back to the, political agenda. What can the folks here in the room do? What, what should we be doing as individuals to really make a difference with this issue? Well, you know, I think, you know, you, you have the internet and uh, you, can, you can figure it out yourself on the 10 things that you should be doing. Uh, but I, I would encourage you to do that and I would encourage you to really look at your habits. I mean, uh, for one, we have this idea that we just fly to here and there for a ball game and that, but uh, not, not to guilt anybody out, but uh, that, that's in our mind in such a way that we don't, we don't see that. I mean, we have to kind of break through our attitudes. And, uh, but we really, uh, within our sphere of influence, I mean, we have to remain positive. But uh, this is a, the, uh, I always looked at the solutions to climate change is really social engagement, which was what we're now yeah. Seeing, we went through. I, I was raised in the '50s, '60s, where we're socially engaged, and for some reason, for 30 years, uh, that went away. But I see now that's we're, that's coming back again. And climate is really about getting engaged with everybody here. It does seem really hopeful with this millennial generation. That yeah, and that's within ourselves too, yeah. not just with the younger people. True. Now, um, my, I've always been waiting. Uh, I was part of the Vietnam era, but to me, that was not. I was involved in it, but it wasn't really my fight. Mm -hmm. And I knew my, I had something else bigger than that or different than that, I should say. And uh, it turned out to be the climate and the youth again. But uh, the fact that the youth are collectively together on the internet, the, you can instantly organize. I mean, this is something that's incredible. If we could, if that is utilized, you could see changes very, very quickly. We're going to go to the audience for questions in just a moment, so start thinking about any questions that you all might have. Uh, one more question for you, Will. There was a lo lot of things in the talk where, I don't, I don't know about you, I'd be freaked out about, especially with the, the water melting through the ice caps and pushing glaciers off the side of the, the land there and such. Are there aspects of this that keep you up at night that you're really the most concerned about, that we don't make a change? What worries you? What keeps you up at night around this issue? I, I don't really, you know. Yeah been at this for such a long time <laughs> that, you know, you don't, it, it takes time and, and uh, there's times when we, in the last 10 years where we, we had some defeats and I, I remember a lot of environmentalists were down, but I said, you know, it's a long haul, just yeah. keep pushing it up the, the hill. But uh, for myself, uh, it's interesting what's happening. You know, I, we interviewed a lot of the elder, the Inuit, the Eskimo elders, uh, the men that were hunters. and. In many ways, they usually would say, uh, you know, they can't, they can't change something that they don't have power to change. They can't do anything about, so therefore they don't think about it. So they, if the sea level rises, we'll just move our buildings up, or if it, we lose the ice, we'll fish. Uh, there's that, kind of that, looking at it that way in a bit, but, but there is a lot you can do about it. But getting down, putting your head in the sand, I mean, I, I'll tell you, within a team, 
the team of all the teams I've ever led, the most dangerous thing of all would be someone thinking that why are we doing this? When you get this type of, of attitude, it's like a poison. Um, and that would I would panic if I had an attitude like that within a team in, in that type of a situation. But you look at your attitude going the other way, the power of that attitude and, and the ability. So I, I, I have faith in that. I have faith in the human spirit of what we can do. And I really think this is going to bring us together. And I think politically we're going to see some, some better changes coming on, on board on this. I definitely think we need more optimistic leaders like yourself. So I you. appreciate all that you're doing. Let's go to the audience for any questions that you all might have then. We have a couple microphones here. Um, someone will be coming around to take questions. Is uh, someone up at the top here? I think we're recording this evening, so that's why we're. <coughs> Hi. I'm wondering about um, some changes that you saw in the wildlife. I know you mentioned that the North Pole was the land of polar bears, yep. but what were some of the most significant changes you saw firsthand? Yeah, uh, the wildlife. Um, um, th th this is the unfortunate part. Um, mass extinction is a very serious thing, and, and uh, when we worked in the 07, 08, 06, around that time in the uh, conservative congregations, I was very surprised how they were open to this because it was, it was a mor I, I, it's a moral issue for me. That's what keeps me moving. But uh, they saw, the conservatives saw the moral imperative of mass extinction, which is something that is very, very difficult. Uh, but of course, any of the animals, and the polar bear is the icon of losing the ice, but uh, the walrus, which is uh, to me is a real shame, um, this is the first ma main uh, sea mammal that we'll, you'll see that will go e into extinction because this animal relies on a floating platform of ice and they dive all day. They go down, they, claw, they eat the clams back and forth. And now the ice is so far out, they, they have to dive deeper and then they use more energy. And, and the extinction always uh, happens on the birthing rates. It's not like the starvation of an individual, but it's the females, they're, they're not getting enough uh, energy, enough food, so the birthing rate starts dropping down. So the, uh, the bigger mammals, like the walrus is one that really, really and, the, and the seal. Uh, uh, big changes in the, on, on land, of migration patterns changing all over. Uh, you have uh, moving northward new birds, new insects, uh, a number of the Inuit elders that we interviewed said that they were glad for the the Disney Channel and and because they without the without the TV they couldn't identify these new things that were showing up on their do, on their doorstep and uh, and it's it, but it's the rate it's the the quickness of it, of it all because the animals some some can maybe slowly but most most plants and animals can't adapt that that quickly and that's. That's, that's the problem. There, it's, it's such a steep curve. There's not, not a curve where uh, a species can adapt and start. And that's, that's what we're doing. And, and uh, so it's, it's, it's very obvious. Uh, the point, I mean, it's been this way for a while. Uh, the, the Inuit, uh, even at the turn of the, la of the century, they knew what was happening up there. Um. Given that we have a problem, not persuading probably this audience that, that, that there are things to be done, but that there are, you know, the other special interest group apart from environmentalists who are the oil industry. When people talk about um, new power generation and clean energy, do you have any ideas as to how you can bring the oil industry, the coal industry, on board with renewable resources? That's a <clears throat> very good point, and uh, uh, they'll do it kind of for looks. But, you know, big profits, big profit. And uh, we are fighting the, the fossil fuel industry. I mean, they, they own presidents and media. Uh, it's a really tough one. Um, so they're not really there. They're, you know, they're, they're, there's some things that they might be happening, but uh, that, that industry is really, really a difficult one. 
they funded the deniers, which was as great as that there is a record of what happened and who did what. It's a financial record. You can trace that down. And I think you'll, you'll see this as the years go by. I mean, if young people are angry, then they should lo look at when, where, where all this got started from. But yeah, it, it is a challenge, the, the, that, that industry. But um, you know, uh, how do we challenge that? Is Well, first of all, in electricity generation, uh, wind, wind uh, is, is almost the same price now as natural gas, and solar soon will bypass that. We'll just outcompete them. But uh, right now, we're closing. We're doing a very good job at closing coal, coal here in Minnesota. And, uh, and natural gas is ha helping move that along. But once we get a natural gas in the mix, then that's there for 30 years, a 30-year depreciation. But uh, uh, the, the lower fuel prices right now is because uh, we're not using as much oil. But uh, as we get more into electrical cars, and uh, pretty soon you'll be able to, you know, basically own your electricity when community solar and you can offset your electrical car. So we're making great progress in, in, this, in this direction. I think it's just the new technology that will make the, the older technology, but it's, it's, a, it's a process of weaning ourselves from that. But um, I sometimes have a problem. Uh, everyone's against the pipeline, they're against the, uh, the oil companies and the coal companies, but who, who leaves their lights on at night? Walk down your block, look at your house. I mean, there's a lot of pointing to the oil trains, but it's like, you know, let's be real about this thing. Uh, look at our own individual waste. And we just, it, we have to be aware is what I'm saying. It, it, it's, it's this attitude that we have or lack of, we're for something, but then we don't see that we're, we're really causing a lot of this issue. Quick follow on to that last question. Do you have strong feelings one way or another about a carbon tax and if that needs to be part of the solution? You know, I don't, I, cap and trade, I don't think is going to cut. I think the tax actually, I think a, a version of the tax could be a situation. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think of that, I, my hunch is that you, we may see something like mm -hmm. that. There are actually some support on the Republican side, which is interesting, mm -hmm. um, and tax on that. We have to do something to <coughs> check it or else we're going to be using that energy that's in the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Something has to check this insanity mm -hmm. of what we're down. And, and the, and the uh, carbon tax could be it. And we can trade it. Uh, we're moving ahead in Minnesota with the Clean Power Plan. Uh, Minnesota's in a real good place. We, we may be making money on this Clean Power Plan because when you have a carbon tax, something like that, when you're already doing a good job in that, you, you save money or you can trade that taxes. So. Tell us more about this green power plant. Oh yeah, the clean power plant, yeah. Uh, the clean power plant, uh, the president is regulating carbon dioxide through the EPA. And the clean power plan that he just passed by presidential powers, not through the Congress. And uh, so each state, with by 2016, it mandated that each state has to come up with a plan to cut cut their energy in certain ways. But there's a lot of latitude in, in doing this. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's moving along. There, there, of course, there's, there's legislation trying to counter that and so forth. But, but it is, uh, it's the first regulation that we had, we've seen through of carbon dioxide. Because the EPA regulates uh, uh, air, air pollution. But then carbon dioxide was put in that mix about the president got that in, I think, four or five years ago. But now he's using that bill with the Clean Power Plan. So we're signing on and uh, working behind the scenes here. Of course, the, the Dayton administration is all behind this and is actually taking the really running with this thing. So it's, it's mandating this to, to a certain, certain percentage at a certain time of uh, eliminating, eliminating carbon. Uh, there's a question over here, I think. Uh, what have you learned from your many years of talking to audiences about climate change and other environmental issues about speaking to groups that are hesitant or, or initially hostile to what you have to say? Yeah, I, I actually prefer um, speaking to the conservative side. I like to go where there's resistance. 
<laughs> and uh, it's a very, very accommodating audience. <laughs> And, uh, and it, you know, it's, it's hard to take it, it's easy to take it the other way here, too, when you, I mean, we have to really re, uh, learn, uh, respect each other, and that there's not enough of that, and it's very, and even on the, uh, our side, the more liberal side. But um, I think going into a, uh, an audience that's not totally where you're at, I think, you know, be respectful, and uh, I, I like working with congregations, because it's, uh, there's there, there's moral issues, and I, I think it's pretty easy to to show that side of it to most people like that. And um, you know the it's it's where you make your progress it really is, and you also learn where where anytime you're doing what you're representing something to go into something opposite. However, uh, dur during the uh, Copenhagen. Uh, summit in, in old nine, there was the climate gate whole thing. Uh, there was a period of time of two or three years where it got really mean and hostile, and I, I actually backed off for a while because the people in the audiences were just horrible. They weren't. They they just weren't. But but I did, But I don't take a look at a person like that and get angry at that person. I look at Fox Network and I look at <laughs> where they're getting this information. <laughs> Because to blame an individual, or if it, it's a good thing. As you look at a person and you think, why why get so angry at this person? Where where where's this person's coming from? What what's influencing this person? And that's that's where you really need to make the fix. Can you give us an example? I'm really really curious. When you're talking to those audiences that don't agree with you, what's one of the most common questions that you get? Well, back when I used to take on the the di denying head on. Uh, it was a great study. Uh, There's always 10 questions. Mm -hmm. I, I studied 10 of them, and, and, I, and I also studied way into it. Mm -hmm. It was a really great study. So every time I would get one of the 10, and there was a priority, I would get that. And they were all teaching moments. Mm -hmm. That when you get a, a curveball like that, if you're, uh, and, you know, if you get angry, you lose everything. But, but it's always an opportunity to point it out. Uh, and I would, I would try to move the audience into the economy and even mm -hmm. agree to disagree with the climate if you have to be, but then get on the economy and the jobs. You can't deny that in Minnesota here, you, and you, you can always win on that. Yeah, and people do see that. The economy is, uh, ma makes a big difference. <clears throat> I, I have to say that just, I, think, I think, at least in Minnesota, I, th I think there's hope in the Republican Party. Uh, the problem with the party, I feel, is their lockstep. And so, but there is a lot in that party right now in Minnesota that they're lockstep because they have to be that way right now. But there's big cracks in that fault line right now. And uh, I, I gave up working with the Republicans about three, four years ago. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to start going back to it because I, th I think the time is ripe now to get some other people on board on this. I mean, just think how wonderful it was. When we, we can't do, we can't put a moon shot, person on the moon, when you're, when you're divided like this. The only way you can do it is you're collectively, you get the spirit going. And uh, this, this is gonna happen here in Minnesota. I think we might have time for just a couple more questions. So in the middle here, and then we'll come down to Jim in the front. You oh, okay. Yep. You started by saying you had helped formulate the Minnesota state energy policy and that you had achieved about 80%, not you personally, but your team. And I'm wondering what was in the 20%. Was it more policy um, initiatives or timelines or what was it exactly? Yeah, timelines, policy. Um, I can't take individual credit. Three of us helped, but then we had a whole, we'd always, it's always, always kind of a spearhead operation. and. And of, and of course, the 80%, there, uh, I wasn't so much even involved in that. I, I work at a certain level, and then, uh, so there's, there was a lot of people. But yeah, a little bit on the policy. Uh, they wanted 10% on the solar mandate, which I didn't think was realistic. In fact, I thought it was too much because what it did, it emboldened the, the utilities. And But we ended up getting 1.5%. The thing that's going to happen on uh, solar is you. You just need like a one and a half percent mandate. You just have to get to get it going like it is now. Solar is going to roll on its own merits. Technology is advancing at a very rapid rate. 
costs are coming way down. Uh, so, uh, solar is also, unlike wind, it's something that we all can invest in and we all see it's such, such a great thing. So, so solar, the solar revolution is going to happen really quickly and you, don't, you just need it at the very beginning uh, part of that. And then there's incentives on that in the, on the federal level, which uh, the usual trick is they'll give you incentives for two years, cut it off, and then at the very end they put it up again but they just do it enough so you can't get the financing. There's, that's what's happening now in solar. It's its usual up and down. But but new new uh, industry like this, there is always this up and down. They play around with it, and that's just part of the hiccups of getting the solar industry going. But uh, so that's that that's moving along really well. Go up here I have and then a come question back. Oh. on fracking. Can you address that a little bit on how much it has contributed to the climate change? Fracking. Yeah, fracking. Um, yeah, it's it's a uh, uh, fracking. Of course, is when you put liquid water, poisons, other chemicals into the earth, and uh, you expand in order to get more gas and that out. And, and it's a not all fracking is bad. Uh, it depends first of all on the on the geology. Some fracking, but again, if you're putting water and other things, like in Colorado, we're putting water in the ground. Uh, so not all fracking is, is, is dangerous, but the, uh, there is a lot of it. Pennsylvania has just ruined their water table. So you, you have several things happening there. You, you can you easily ruin the water table, which is like, wow, what happens when you lose your water table? And then there's uh, the emissions, extra emissions and leakage. And uh, if, if that is not capped well geologically above it, you're going to have leakage and all sorts of... So the low price that we're all... Uh, experiencing here and heating and that, that's because of fracking. And our economy is moving ahead. One reason is because of fracking. But uh, the sooner we can get away from this, the better. Jim? Oh, Will, your organization, Climate Generation, has sent 10 teachers to Paris as part of this, uh, as part of the climate discussions in Paris. And what do you hope that they'll bring back, and how are you going to use those teachers, or how are they going to be able to tell their story? Yeah, actually, the teachers are already, they, again, there are uh, six schools from Minnesota, four from the rest of the states. Uh, they're already in, you know, part of our curriculum and part of their curriculum, so nationwide, their, their stories are reaching many, many students. And they'll come back, of course, as ambassadors, and uh, this is very key. And they'll become back inspired, but then when teachers inspire, they, they, that inspiration really, really travels. Uh, in uh, Copenhagen in '09, we had we had uh, students. Unfortunately, we're the only teachers delegation in the United States that's there. Uh, but uh, they're really reaching a lot, great numbers. We have three of our staff that are there too. I think it's a real good counterbalance to this horrible thing that happened in Paris here three weeks ago, and uh, and but it's it's going well for them right now, and. Uh, I have uh, literature on our, our climate generation on, on the table out there, so if you feel free to come and pick up some stuff and check out our climategen.org. You can see our programs and donate if you wish. And um, I'm, I'm just very pleased. Uh, Nicole Rahm was my executive director, uh, best hire I ever made here 10 years ago. She's he heading it. We got 12 staff, 800,000 a year budget. And we started, you know, the first three, four years were really touch and go, but, uh, but we, we grew into this. We rebranded, we are Will Steger Foundation for a, a while, but we, that, the trouble with that name, it didn't tell what we were doing, and it was a two-year rebrand, which was really tough, but we came up with the right name. Well, I want to give you the last word on tonight before we uh, head out, and I think there's some time to mingle, too, after this. What gives you hope for the future? You know, 20 years from now, when we're here in Minnesota, Minneapolis. You're running and biking and walking. The air is going to be pure. You're going to see the stars. I mean, the air is a cesspool. I don't run in the city. I don't bike in the city. By people biking next to buses, the cancers, everything that we're from the use of fossil fuels, burning garbage next to our baseball field. I mean, 20 years from now, this is all, it's, it's going to be a great, a great planet, but you know, uh, there are changes. We're going to have to adapt to things in the pipeline. We can avoid the worst of the catastrophe, 
if we move decisively now, we're starting to move that way, but we all have to be part of that. So. It's a real honor speaking with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to also thank our sponsors again tonight, the Friends of the Libraries, the Institute on Environment, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, and Thanks Northrop, and Good also job. Climate <laughs> Generation. And I can't let you leave without saying, if you're not a friend of the library and you enjoy programs like this, I hope you'll consider joining and supporting us. There's literature out on the table along with the things uh, that Will mentioned tonight. Thank you all and have a good evening. <laughs>